Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the next session on ADS-P. Um, so last time we started talking about the Hilbert transform and the Hilbert transform was a piece that we used to obtain a filter which passes um, positive frequencies and suppresses negative frequencies. So for instance if we have a sinusoidal function and the sinusoid can be written as um, the imaginary part of a complex exponential or you can also write it as e to the j omega uh, minus e to the minus j omega and if you then just suppress the part of e to the minus j omega then what you're left with e to the j omega and this is easy then for computing the amplitude of the sinusoid at each time step immediately without waiting until it becomes maximum or minimum. So this is uh, this kind of filter which makes this possible. So here we pass the positive frequencies, which you can see, going from 0 to pi. And then the other half, from pi to 2 pi, is the negative frequencies. Remember, we have like this 2 pi periodicity. So 2 pi is 0 again. So when you go down here, this is the negative frequency. So this is a filter that we obtained last time and you can see we get some attenuation here, maybe 30 dB attenuation here for the negative frequency half. And as part of the filter, as part of this filter, we use the Hilbert transform, which basically is just a 90 degrees phase shifter for all frequencies. Right. So here we have a linear phase. So this is starting at zero um, degrees because it's the complete filter, but as part of this filter, we have this 90 degrees phase shift. So this is basically obtained from our formula that we derived. Here we have this one over n um, impulse response. Yeah. So here's what I just said. So we have a passband which is about 6 dB, um, about 0 dB, um, because we have a factor of 2 in it, which we um, use to make um, the Hilbert transform without this factor of 2, so just for convenience. And we have, as a result, about minus 30, minus 30 dB attenuation, which is not very much, but this came from reviewing our ideal impulse response. Remember, we have this infinitely long impulse response from minus infinity to plus infinity, and we had to renew it to make a finite length. And this also means that we only have a finite attenuation. So if we make it longer, we could um, increase this attenuation. Yeah, so checking is important to see how good our design is working. So we have to decide if 30 dB is enough or not. If we decide it's not enough, we need to fit a, we need to make the fit a lot. Yeah. There's also a Python function, Remis, um, which has an option of the Hilbert transform. So we already know Remis for low pass design, for instance, or band pass design. But you can also use it for um, a Hilbert transform or Hilbert filter, but just specifying type equals Hilbert. Right? So this is one of the lesser known options of Remis. So otherwise it works the same. So here SP is psi pi signal. This is the order of the filter. Here you have uh, the pass band, or in this case, this is the band um, where we want to um, have a valid Hilbert transform because we saw we cannot really go right to frequency zero or right to frequency pi because we need a transition band. So here we have uh, basically some distance to zero and some distance to Nyquist. Remember 0.5 for Remus was Nyquist. So this basically is the transition band. This gap to 0.5 and this gap to zero. So actually we only have a very tiny transition band here. Yeah, so this is then our filter, and then we can analyze it using Frexy. 
<coughs> so on here I'm giving limits to the axis and here is on the, the frequency axis and here the phase axis and I can do that yeah, so that's really what, what I just said <coughs> 0.5 corresponds to an IP frequency time for Remis so the specified pass band doesn't go all the way to 0 and 0 0.5 because we need transition bands to the size. Yeah, and the more transition band we leave it, the more attenuation we will have for the negative frequencies. So if the design is not sufficient, we have to increase either the order or the size of the transition band. So let me even look at it. So here we can see magnitude. Here we see this actually right at zero as it's supposed to be because it's a Hilbert transform alone. And then we can see here our band edges that we can see indeed we have this transitioning to stopping for the negative frequencies. And here we can see 1.5 for the phase. So here, it's, in this case, it's plus 1.5, and 1.5 is pi over 2, roughly, which is 90 degrees. So this is what I mentioned here. This design now has plus 90 degrees, so roughly plus 1.5 phase shift at frequency 0. So this is the phase difference of 180 degrees from our previous design with a rectangular window and results from a sign change of the coefficients. So it's just flipping the signs. And, and again, this doesn't really matter because we can always compensate for it by using a factor, like a factor of minus one here in this case. Um, yeah, so that's not kind of easy. Yeah, so here we have the desired 90 degrees phase shift. And yeah, do you still remember where this slope came from? So the slope is basically the delay that we need. We need to um, have a delay um, to get good filters. So remember, we have this infinite impulse response where we have the largest value around sample zero, and then it was tapering down towards negative and positive values. And when we want to apply a window, we want to apply it to the center. But we want to avoid negative samples because we want to have a causal system, so we have to shift it to the positive samples. And this shift to positive samples leads to a delay, and this is what you see here. Right, so this is the um, constant delay for all frequencies, which leads to this slope in the phase. Right, remember when we have the delay, the frequency response was e to the minus d omega. For the delay d. And then this slope here is the d. So the d basically is, an, uh, this slope is an artifact to make our filter cause. Yeah, and then we can take a look at our resulting filter. Now we're using this uh, Remis design. So if we have the Remus filter, remember the filter, complete filter, results from the delta impulse plus our Remus filter. Where is it? Where is the B? The B came from our design above. So here you can see this B. And here you can see it came here from this Remus function. Right? So these are our coefficients, the filter coefficients. For the, for the Hilbert transform. And remember, the Hilbert transform is making the imaginary part of a given real part, basically. That's why we have here the delta impulse. So this is just a 1 at position 0. And here, as imaginary part, we have the Hilbert transform filter. 
So if we then apply this filter to a signal, then the signal is treated as a real part and the imaginary part comes out of the Hilbert filter. Right. So here this delta we will also see is the shifted version because we need to compensate for the shift, the delay for our Hilbert transform. Remember we need to make it causal and that includes a shift and we need to apply the, shape, the same shift to the real part. Right? So that's why I'm assigning the warning here at delta of 10. So we need to shift the real part, the original input, so that it fits to the then created imaginary part. Right. <clears throat> so here, this is the one at position 10, and then we have the coefficient coefficients coming out of Remus um, around it. So here you can see this is the one. Right? So this is basically the center. And then here to the sides we have the coefficients which are just imaginary parts um, to the sides of it. Yeah. So there's also a sign change compared to our design above. So maybe if we just scroll up. So here we have delta plus 1j times b. And when we look at this filter here, the one was, here's the one. And here we have plus j and minus j. comes from our Remus design. So we have these flipped coefficients and when we look at the frequency response, the corresponding frequency response here using our Bexley function, we now see that the positive frequencies are attenuated and the negative ones are passed as a result of our sign change. And basically Instead of plus 90 degrees, no. instead of minus, we have no plus. So this also shows you how you can select which half of the frequency region you want to have. If you want to have the positive frequency region, you need minus 90 degrees. If you want to have the negative region, plus 90 degrees. So that's going to be, we just have a, a switch which flips the sign of the coefficients and then you can select either the positive or the negative half of the frequency range. And you can also see we get roughly the same attenuation here in this case. So again we have about the 60 B attenuation uh, the 60 B gain in the pass band and here about minus 20 dB attenuation in the stop band. So again it comes roughly at 30 dB. So this is actually comparable to our design. Except now we have an equal ripple, so that's typical for Remus. Right? Remus always gives us the same height of the ripples in the stop band and also in the pass band. So that's often preferable to have the same size of the ripples. Because then you, then you can say we have this much attenuation and that's true for the entire stop band. So that's just convenient. <coughs> yeah, and, um, this is using our um, Frexy function from, that you can download from Moodle. So here you have the advantage that it plots right away, so you don't need to enter the plot functions. And you also have those options for the scale of the frequency axis. And um, the dB axis.
this copy and paste the quote here. Take a look what's inside B. So what do you think? How many coefficients will we get in B? Negative three. No. So let's see. We have one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Four times five is twenty plus one is twenty. Well that works. Nice. So we have those twenty coefficients and you can see these are actually the numbers that we just saw and this should be position number 10 I guess so we have 4, 8 so this starts with 0 so then this is 7, 8, 9, 10 right? so this is where we put the 1 And you can see I imported Frexy here. And this is not from any SciPy library, but this is the Frexy that is already present, which I downloaded uh, from Moodle. So we can just use it. If you don't have it, you can also use the SciPy signal Frexy, but then you have to plot your setup. Make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so here we have the same plot that we just saw um, for our Remus design where we have this plus 90 degrees, plus 1.5. So that works. So this is what we just saw. And now the actual one sided filter. delayed pulse and here is our filter copy paste so h1 ms here now you can see the coefficients so these are the same numbers as before just that we have um, plus jb so here we have the one and here you can see these coefficients are now with, uh, with a J. So then we have B below it. You can see it's the same numbers. Just here we have the J. So um, this is now our complete filter. This H1 remnant, which now makes up our one sided filter, and we can plot it using this line here. So now I'll try this one here. Yeah, actually, this is exactly what we just. 
just saw, we have our one sided filter which now passes the negative frequencies and attenuates the positive frequencies because we have this phase shift of plus 90 degrees instead of minus 90 degrees. So this works and shows you um, how we can use our frequency function. But as I said, you don't have to use our frequency function, you can also use side pi signal and then just plot um, 20 times log base 10 of f's of h. So this is just the convenience. Yeah, so this is what we just saw. Yeah, so again we have roughly this minus 30 dB attenuation, which is now for the positive frequencies because of the sign change of the Reynolds filter. So we obtain more practical filter with more attenuation in the stop band if we change the corner frequencies to above zero and below 0.5 in Ramis, which means increasing the transition bandwidth. So, yeah. Also interesting is the equilibrium behavior, as I just said, um, from Ramis, which is often preferable in practice. Yeah, then we can actually use it for our um, application example, the instantaneous amplitude. So we want to see how good we are with measuring the instantaneous um, amplitude. And we can just test it on our um, example, measuring the amplitude of a sinusoid with our Hilbert transform design. So we saw that the lower end of the passband of our design is at the normalized frequency of about 0.05. Hence, we tested um, at a, with a sinusoid at that frequency. So, this is actually testing um, the extreme case for the silver design because this is right at the edge of what it can do. Right? So, here is our sinusoid. So, I have 40 samples from 0 to 39. Here, I have I times 0.05. So this um, 0.05 was normalized for Nyquist being 1. And we know Nyquist for the sinusoid is pi. Right? So that's why pi times dot 05 corresponds to this frequency. So it's basically a renormalization. So then we can plot it and we get this. shows you what the convenience for iPython was. You don't need the MP in Python you need the MP. Yeah, what, sh what shall I do with the plot? Can I just use plot? Not defined. So there's also a difference to um, IPython, and Python still need to say plt.short. And this is the reason that we can plot more on it. Right? Before we can short, we can also say plot y, plot z, and then when we're done, we say plot short. Okay, so this is uh, 
done for being able to plot in several plots on top of each other. Yeah, so this is actually now one period of the sinusoid, and we want to compute the amplitude. So just looking at the picture, we would have to wait until it reaches the top or the bottom to um, say what amplitude we have. But with a Hilbert transform, we can do it quicker. So this is now the sinusoid. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that the, the peak here is also at sample number seven, uh, 10. Right, and remember, we needed to have a delay of 10 for our Hilbert design for this one sided filter. So, this actually coincides here in this case. So, now we can filter the signal with um, our filter, which passes only the positive frequencies, our design, um, XH1. Says the advantage that you memorize from which library it came from. Right? So that works. And then the next one is the inlet, the imaginary part. Remember, this is now not from our original design, but the Remus design. And now we can actually also compare the two. So here is the Remus, that is our original design. And here is the um, Remus design. Can you see the difference? So what's the difference? And it's basically sign flip, right? So this goes up, this goes down. So besides that, it looks quite similar. Right? But we have the sign change, uh, which we saw also in the design. Right? We get basically opposite signs and our coefficients. And that's also why we get the result with opposite, uh, opposite signs. And so plus 90 degrees, we have a right sign. Apart from that, it's fine. So we have 90 degrees phase shift, plus or, 90, plus, or plus or minus 90, depends on which you take. And it needs a little bit of time to, to um, get to valid samples between 15 and 45. So we're not there right away. You can see here, it needs some time to um, catch up. Yeah, and then we can actually compute the magnitude just using function apps. Right. 
Remember what the function x is doing? Absolute. Yeah. How can, you how can you compute the magnitude? Here squared plus minus squared under root squared. Exactly. Right. So we take imaginary part squared plus real part squared and then the square root. And that's also why the sign of our imaginary part doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter if we have now plus imaginary or minus imaginary part. Because for the magnitude it's the same. So now we can type this. So we have PLT plot of NP dot Fs. So Fs is also an NP. There's actually also an NP without an S. Did you know? Maybe I can show you what happens if you use it. S X H one. So actually the NPFs is made for arrays. Let's see if we get a difference if we use NPFs. Yeah, just the same. Interesting. Yeah, so you can see it's not perfect. Compared to um, our original design, oh, I actually like our original design better, right? So if you look at it, it has less of a dip here when you compare to this one here. Or maybe it's an optical illusion. Maybe I should plot um, the other ones on top of it. So the real part. And the imaginary part, and then the apps, and then the show. Yeah, that looks better. So here you can see the original sinusoid. This comes out of our Hilbert transform, and the orange line is the resulting magnitude from it. So yeah, it's actually looking quite similar to our design here. And when we look at it, we get the amplitude to about 10% accuracy. Right. So we have some deviation, it goes up and down, but it's maybe to about 10%. And this actually roughly corresponds to 20, 20 dB attenuation, minus 20 dB, uh, 20 dB attenuation. We saw a little bit more, but it's roughly this order. So, because 20 dB corresponds to an attenuation factor of 0.1, and this corresponds to an accuracy of about 10%. And if we have 10% error, then it's a factor of 0.1. Yeah, so this also hints at the fact that we can improve the magnitude estimation by having a filter with a higher attenuation and negative frequencies, or positive if we have the other design. So also observe that this only works for sinusoids um, inside our pass band. So you might also get a better result if the sinusoid is a little bit more inside our pass band. Remember, this was right at the edge. So this was, uh, to begin with, a problematic case. So if we have more inside the pass band, we might get more precise magnitude estimates. Okay. Yeah, questions at this point? Make sense so far? Okay. Then we start with the next set of slides. Yeah, so this will be about Wiener filters and match filters and later prediction. So 
This is now another application of filters. Match filters gave us, uh, well, I mean, the Hilbert transform gave us a precise phase. And now the Wiener and Match filters are there to improve a signal. Right? So they are not specified in terms of magnitude and phase, as we had so far. But here the goal is to improve a signal or detect a signal. Right. So here we don't have a concrete phase or magnitude of the counter, but there is a signal involved. And that's the moving point. So both have the goal to reduce the influence of noise or distortions. So assume we have some signal X as the original, maybe some speech signal, speech audio signal, and Y is the distorted signal. Maybe we have noise in the recording, for instance. Then this distorted signal is X plus some noise V. Right? So V is my noise. And I assume that it's independent white noise. So this is coming from somewhere else. So this is not part of the speech, but it's independent. And white noise means it has a flat spectrum. You have the same noise at each frequency. So remember, this independent white noise is kind of unrealistic. So when we have a recording, this is basically never the case. Right? But it has the advantage that we can find easy solution for a problem. Right? So that's what we do. So, for the Wiener filter case, we have our distorted signal, and when we filter this distorted signal with our Wiener filter, we want to be as close as possible to the original signal X. Right, so, if we have recording plus noise, and then put it through the Wiener filter, we want to minimize the effect of the noise. Yeah, so, this, the goal here is signal fidelity. The reconstruction should be as close as possible to the original. And this is done, for instance, for denoising an image or audio signal. So it's not only working for audio signals, you can also do the same for images. Um, you can apply a Wiener filter to an image to denoise images. For instance, an image you took in darkness is often grainy. And this graininess actually can be seen as this um, independent white noise. Right. So it also works for images. Then you just have two dimensional filters instead of a one dimensional filter. But the principle holds. Then we have the matched filter, and the matched filter um, is not about signal fidelity, but to obtain a high signal to noise ratio for detection. So you want to minimize the influence of the noise by designing a filter which basically ignores the noise part. So if you take the noisy signal and put it through this filter, then the output should be almost the same as if you took the original signal and put it through the same filter. Right? So basically, the filter should be able to ignore the noise. The output should be independent, as independent as possible um, to the noise. Yeah, and this is important in communication applications. For instance, where you would like to detect a zero or one or any given known signal, usually a deterministic signal. Right? You want to detect something if something is there, like OFDM um, or CDMA. You have certain waveforms which um, uh, represent, for instance, a zero or one, and you want to detect it in noise. Is there a zero, or is there a one, or is there nothing? Right. And this is what you can do with a mesh filter. Or you can also use it for object recognition, images. For instance, face recognition. If you have a known face, and you want to detect it in an image, you can use a mesh filter for it. Right. 
you can run a matched filter over an image and if this image has the face present somewhere then this um, matched filter should give you a high output at the position where the face is detected. So after the matched filter you would have mostly zeros in the image but at the place where the face is you would have a one for instance. This is how you can do face detection. And this is actually also a um, predecessor of um, neural networks for face detection. Actually neural networks use something like a match filter in the first layer. Yeah, so let's start with the Wiener filter. The goal here is the approximation of the original signal in the least mean squared sense, meaning we would like to minimize the mean quadratic error between the filter and the original signal because it is mathematically convenient. Right? So it's not like that it sounds best if you do this to an audio signal, for instance, but we can get a closed form solution to it. Mean squared error sense is always um, easy mathematically because um, we can apply the chain rule to the derivative. If we have x squared, then we have 2 times x derivative. Yeah, so we have a filter system with a Wiener filter. Then we have the noisy signal convolved with the Wiener filter, should be as close as possible to the original signal x meaning we filter our distorted signal with our still unknown filter HW for Wiener. Yeah, and the convolution of this Wiener filter with filter length L with Y is this formula, as we all know. Right? Here we have the well-known convolution formula. Here you can see M is the sum index, M goes down in 1 in the first argument and goes up in the second argument. So this minus m plus m is always a um, sign that this is a convolution. So the result here should be as close as possible to x. Yeah, and a well-known mathematical approach to obtain the minimum of a mean squared error in the matrix framework is the so-called Moore-Penrose pseudo inverse. Right. So we could now use h in a numerical optimization to minimize it given y and x. So if we have a training set of clean and distorted signals, we can then use numerical optimization to find the optimum h. Right? That would be possible. But it turns out in this case we also have a closed form solution. Right? And that's why we can take a look at the more pen rolls of pseudo inverse. Have you heard about this before? Yeah, it's not so very long. So, this gives us actually a solution, but for the matrix case. Right? So, to be able to apply it, we can reformulate the convolution as a matrix multiplication. So, for that, we define two vectors. The first is the vector of the past L samples of our noisy signal, which you can see here. So, here is this vector. It starts with a present sample of the noisy signal and then goes back into the past and samples into the past. Make sense? So this is basically what the filter currently sees. When we look at our convolution sum, it goes back into the past and samples. Yeah, and then the next vector contains the impulse response, like this. No, we count up. So it goes from coefficient 0 up to coefficient L minus 1. So this contains our still unknown filter coefficients for the width for the Wiener filter. And using those two vectors, we can now rewrite our convolution as vector multiplication. So here is the vector of the L past samples, and we multiply it with our L coefficients. And out comes the current predicted sample, x of n. At this point, this is just a wish. It should be x of 1. Right? 
So this HW has no time index because it already contains all the samples of the time reverse inverse response and is constant over the file. And we want to have fixed coefficients for our signal. Yeah, and we can now also put the alpha values xn into a row vector like this. So this might be really long. It contains all samples of our filtered signal. Right. And to obtain this um, column vector, we simply assemble all the row vectors of our noisy signal into a matrix. So, um, Y was the noisy signal, and here we have the noisy signal also as a vector, which we saw here. So, here we see our noisy signal, but this is the finite length vector of length L. Right. And now we put all those vectors into a matrix A. So here you can see the matrix A, and each row contains later noisy samples, right? 10 each. So here the first 10, then here 10 shifted by one sample, then 10 shifted by two samples, and so on. Or one sample later, two samples later, and so on. So now we can multiply this matrix A with our coefficient vector H. So here this transpose means I make it into a column vector. And then out comes the filtered version, X transpose. Transpose again because it now is a column vector. So this is just another way of writing our convolution. For example, for a filter length of L equals 2, we get this example here. So here we can see this is the matrix A, this is our vector HW, and this is the resulting filtered output. Okay, so here I'm using this arrow to say that we would like to be as close as possible to this output. Yeah, so this is now the matrix formulation. So if we have a noisy signal, and if we have the original clean signal, so if we have both, then we just need to find these coefficients, which minimize the output, the distance between the output and the clean signal. Make sense? So this result should be as close as possible to this one. And um, the coefficients to find are those two. So the rest is given. Yeah, so this is the matrix formulation of our convolution. And now we can obtain the minimum mean square error solution of this matrix multiplication using the more Penrose pseudo inverse. This pseudo inverse finds the column vector H transpose, which minimizes the distance to a given x with the matrix which contains our signal y to be fit. So here, this is our um, equation with our desired goal. And we want to obtain h, the h w. So matrix A and vector x are known. So this is done in a training phase to obtain wiener filter coefficients h, h w from a noisy signal in a matrix A and the known clean signals in vector X. 
So imagine you have some recordings that you made for train your filter. You have a clean recording and then you add some noise and then you have both X and Y. Yeah, so the vector h, w is unknown so far. After the training phase, the filter can also be applied to similar signals. So we train our coefficients using typical speech signals, for instance, or typical images. And then we take those coefficients and apply them to unknown signals, unknown voices or unknown images, and hope that it still works. This filter still um, is cleaning up um, the signal. So this problem can be solved exactly if the matrix A is square and invertible. Right? So then we can just take the inverse and bring it to the other side. Right? So then you see H transpose is A inverse times X. So for instance, if we just have two samples in our signal, in this case, then it works. But that's kind of an un unrealistic um, case because usually we have more than um, two samples in this case. Yeah, so this cannot be done if A is non square, which it is in all practical cases. For instance, if it has many more rows than colors. In this case, we don't have an exact solution but many solutions that come close to x, right? We can still find the minimum. There is no exact solution, but we can find the minimum. We would like to obtain the solution which comes closest to x in the mean square error distance, also called Euclidean distance. Do you know why it's called Euclidean distance? It goes back to Euclid, who computed the, the triangle. So if you have three coordinates, x, y, z, then um, the distance between two coordinates is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and then you take the square root of it. Right? So this is basically um, the um, Euclidean distance. And the Euclidean distance is the mean squared um, error. Make sense? So this solution is derived using the pseudo-inverse and here we can see how we get it. We multiply both sides by A transpose. Right? So originally we just have A H W transpose equals X. So now we multiply from the left hand side with A, a transpose. Right? You can see it. So now this vector A transpose A is a square matrix because when you think about A as a torn matrix, A transpose as a fat matrix. So you have fat times tall. Does that make sense? <coughs> hmm. yeah, I guess. <coughs> yeah, so here we have a square matrix, and the formulation is no longer overdetermined. Hence, we can replace the right arrow by an equal sign. So that's why we now have this equal. Hence, the matrix, the square matrix, the square matrix is usually invertible, such that we obtain our solution. Yeah. So in our case of the two by two. Uh, of the two, um, two samples, two coefficients, this matrix A transpose A would be a two by two matrix. Right. So now this would be a vector, a column vector of two coefficients, and A transpose A would be a two by two matrix. And a two by two matrix, um, we hope that it's invertible. Right. It doesn't have to be, but it's quite likely that it's invertible. And this is what we're then using for the solution. You just bring this part here over to the other side. And then we have a solution for H transpose. Right? So if 
this was invertible, we have a solution. And most of the time, it is inversion. If not, we are not. Then we have to try different zero. Yeah, so actually the signal that is based on this, um, the, mat the matrix A is based on our signal, and if you find a singular matrix, a transpose A, we just use a different signal. So this might be um, non-invertible if the signal is only containing silence. Then we have all zeros. Yeah. So now we have a solution, right? The solution that we're looking for. And this solution has the minimum mean squared distance to the unnoisy version of our solution. So now here we are as close as possible to this X, um, the clean signal. And this is what we wanted to have. And this shows why it's. Um, helpful to have this mean squared error distance because it allowed us to use the more Penrose solution. Easy, right? Without numerical optimization, now we have a closed form solution. So now we can actually try it on uh, denoising speech. So now I'm using IPython again. I'm using our sound library. So remember, sound.py is a Moodle, so you need to download it to import it. Here again, our sidecar signal. Then we have both read, which is part of our sound library here. So with both read, we read this um, speech signal from the WAF file. So X is the signal, F S is the sampling. Yeah. So here I make this X a color matrix and a matrix type. So X as, as it comes out of WAF read is an array. And now I turn it into a matrix so that I can easily apply matrix multiplications because we saw here we use plenty of matrix multiplications. And um, yeah, then I can also play back to test it, to see if we have the right signal. So here I have to again turn it back into an array to play it back for the sound function. Then I add a uh, white noise to make a, a, a distorted signal out of it. So here I have x plus 0 0.1 times some random numbers of the same shape as x. So here you can see I'm uh, generating random number of the shape of x. Random generates uh, random numbers between 0 and 1, but I want to have it centered around 0, so I subtract 0.5 here. And then I scale it, the entire thing, by 2 to the 15th. So x is already in this range, and for the noise, I scale the noise here to be in the same range. So now I have added noise. So Y is now my noisy signal. And in this case, um, this fulfills the condition of the independent white noise. But it's not Gaussian. It's not Gaussian nonsense. This is uniform distribution. Yeah, and then we can play back the noisy signal here. And we assume that we want to have 10 coefficients. Usually 10 to 12 is a good number for speech signal, it turns out. And here I'm making my matrix A. I initialize it with zeros. So I'm taking 100,000 columns, each column having 10 um, entries in each row. Right? 10 because that's our filter length. So we have a very tall matrix. 10 wide and 100,000 high. And then I assign our noisy signal to this matrix A. So each, um, each row gets a piece of the noisy signal, as you can see here. So this M goes over all rows, and then each row gets a piece of our noisy signal shifted by the index M. 
So we start with index zero, so we get the beginning, then we start with one, then we get the word with one, sample shifted, and so on. Then sample two. So starting at sample M, we get the next 10 samples. Yeah. So each row contains 10 samples of our noisy signal. So then we can print the shape, 100,010. Yeah, and then we compute the Wiener filter. And here we also apply a trick. We allow a filter delay of five samples, and it turns out that it actually improves the performance, um, like in the Hibbert case. Yeah, if you have a delay, then you get the largest samples uh, coefficients in the center, and that improves our filter. Yeah. So this corresponds to the center of our Wiener filter. And the desired filter is hence x5 to 105,000. So at the beginning, we start with sample number five. And this corresponds to the five sample delay. And we use the matrix type, which means star is the matrix multiplication. So that's a little bit tricky, but it allows me to write the pen, uh, our solution pretty much immediately, like we just saw. So H here is the inverse of A transpose times A times A transpose times X. Right. This is exactly the formula that we just saw. So yeah, this formula. Right. So I just take this formula directly to the Python code. So now this H contains 10 coefficients, which are now our Wiener filter, which we can now plot. Right. So here you can see the impulse response. So you can see indeed, here at around sample number 4, we have the main peak here. And, um, you can also see why it makes sense to have this delay because the largest value here is really where we have um, our delay and then we have some ripples to the side. So basically the same effect um, as when we were really doing for low pass filter or our Hilbert transform. Yeah, basically it looks a little bit like a low pass filter. Right? When you think about it, here we have the main row and here we have the side ripples. It reminds us really of a low pass filter. So we can actually check it using Frexy. And here you can see the frequency response. And well, it indeed is a low pass filter because it passes all low frequencies and it attenuates high frequencies. But it's kind of a funny low pass filter because it doesn't really have a stop band. Right? There's no, no real stop band. It's uh, like going up and down here. And, you know, maybe you can see here this upper end a little bit as a stop band. But it's kind of like a funny filter. But when you think about it, it also makes sense because it's not supposed to be a low pass filter. It's supposed to be a denoising filter. And what it actually does is basically it adjusts to the spectrum of speech. So it tries to keep the speech intact, but then it tries to attenuate all regions where the speech does not have much energy. And in those regions, you basically only have noise. Right? And this, for instance, here in those high frequency regions, there's not much going on in speech, so all, what's, all, all, that, all that's there is noise. So it makes sense to attenuate the noise there. And it turns out also here in this, this middle region here, it seems the speech doesn't have much energy, so it attenuates anything that's there because what's there is mostly noise. Right. Yeah, you can also see it's a nonlinear phase because it was non symmetric, so here you can see it particularly well. Nonlinear phase. Yeah, so we can see that it has a low pass characteristic because that's where our speech signal is at low frequencies. 
at high frequencies, we have mostly noise, and hence it makes sense to have more attenuation there. So this attenuation curve is the, of this Wiener filter also has some similarity of this speed spectrum. If you compare it with the spectrum of our white noise, then we see that low frequencies, um, at low frequencies the speech is dominating, and at high frequencies noise is dominating. Hence we need to remove or attenuate that latter noisy part of the spectrum. So we can also plot the spectrum of speech and the noise together, this time with grammars from the signal processing library without the building plotting, <coughs> because we want to plot it on top of each other. So here you can see the code. So here you can see the signal processing uh, sci-fi uh, signal track seed. Right? And this returns W, this is the frequency sampling points at which it computes the um, transfer function. Here H speech is a transfer function of our X or the frequency response of our speech signal. So basically this applies a very long FFT to our entire speech signal and so that we can see the spectrum of the speech signal. Then here we have the same for the noisy speech. Here we have the frequency response of our filter, the Wiener filter, and then we plot it on top of each other. So first, in dB, we have the speech, the clean speech, then we have the noise. This is just the noise, not the noisy speech. I made a mistake. So here, this is just noise itself. So here we pl um, plot um, the frequency response of the noise. And then we plot the frequency response of our filter with some offset here to um, let it appear at uh, similar levels. And then I plot it with the labels. And here you can see the result. So here you can see blue is the speech. Right? You can see here the speech is strongest at low frequencies. So speech is strongest here at the very low frequencies. Then it goes down in this middle range, and then it goes up again, and then here it goes down. And then you can see in the red is the white noise, and this has the same energy all over the place, so for all frequencies. Yeah, now you can see where the speech is stronger than the noise, or similar. So you can see here in the beginning, it's much stronger than noise, and this is where you have the pass band of our filter. Then here it dips down, so this is mostly noise, and here the filter also goes down. Right? So this is correct. And then here the speech becomes stronger again, on the order of the noise, so the filter goes up again, passes more. And then here in this region, highest frequencies, you have mostly noise, not much speech, and it attenuates more. So here it removes the noise. So basically this filter attenuates more where we have a bad SNR for our signal. So here regions of bad SNR, this region and this region, we have more attenuation. And this is the principle of the Wiener filter. So the attenuation depends on the signal to noise ratio in different frequency regions. see that the speech dominates the spectrum only at low and middle frequencies, noise at other frequencies, hence it makes sense to suppress the noisy frequencies. So now we can actually filter it using the L filter function. We now use L filter to filter our noisy speech with our Wiener filter. So this is what you can see here. Sci-fi signal, L filter, then we have our coefficients, the filter coefficients. I turn it into an array type. And 
this is to make it into a one-dimensional array. Here we have a one-dimensional array for the coefficient b, uh, no a, we have no feedback path. And this is now the noisy signal as an array. And remember, we computed it as a matrix, so we have need to turn it into an array type again for the L filter. Yeah, so XW is the Wiener filter output. And we can listen to it. So let's see if we have sound. Mm. Okay, I think I'm a speaker. To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet sometimes it's necessary to do so. To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet sometimes it's necessary to do so. So I could hear it's very noisy. So I took a second, right? So because it's a huge matrix. So now I'm computing this all Wiener filter, right? Mm -hmm. Wiener filter. So now we have H, and here you can see our coefficients. So you can see it's a matrix column vector, and it's two dimensional because it's the matrix type. Well, even if I say array of H, it's, it's two dimensional, right? And that's um, what we need to take in, uh, into account. Matrices are always two dimensional. So now we have our filter. We don't need to plot it again, but here, this is the interesting part. 
Viel Spaß und Neues. So, here can now see I turn this into an array type. Our Wiener filter is turned into an array type. And here I remove one dimension. So this is now our XW, the Wiener filter version. And now we can play the XW. To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet sometimes it's necessary to do so. So what do you think? Is it better? Then if you compare it to more items. To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet sometimes it's necessary to do so. So this is the noisy version, and this is the denoisy version. To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet sometimes it's necessary to do so. Yeah, somewhat better, right? Yeah. yeah, you can also hear that the signal sounds more muffled, which means high frequencies are missing, which is what this filter really does, right? It really removes the high frequencies. And you could argue maybe it removes too much of the high frequencies. Right? So it's, it's still a question if it actually sounds better to the human ear, because the ear is not looking for the mean squared error solution. Right? The ear is maybe also able to pick up signals in noise. So here the Wiener filter basically assumes everything below the noise is useless and can be removed, more or less. But um, the ear is actually quite good picking up weak signals in noise. So this mean square error solution is um, giving us an easy solution, but it might actually be not the best for the human ear. And it's similar for images. Right? When you apply um, Wiener filters to images, they easily look blurred, because the Wiener filter doesn't know what's important to the eye. And for the eye, edges are important. And if the filter uh, uh, removes edges, that's bad. So it's basically also the same problem for images. Yeah. So this filter that we just obtained um, could now also be applied to other speech signals with similar frequency characteristics for uh, signal and noise. So remember, we also chose a certain noise level. So this Wiener filter also depends on how much noise we need. So if we have less noise, then this filter will be less aggressive removing parts. If we have more noise, then the filter will be more aggressive removing parts. Right? So the coefficients also depends on how much noise we add. So it depends on the signal. So it wants to know the spectrum of the signal. And it also wants to know how much noise there is. But if we have then other speech signals and other, uh, other noises which have the same characteristic, then this filter works as well. Right? It only depends on, on the general frequency characteristics and the strength of the noise. It doesn't need to know the particular signal. Yeah, we can actually check if it indeed reduced the mean squared error. So we can compare the mean squared quadratic error, the mean MSE, to see if it indeed reduced um, and by how much. So here we compute it. So we can take the signal X. It actually has 270,000 samples. But we only take um, the first 200,000 here. So here we take the noisy signal, subtract the unnoisy signal, compute the power, and divide by the number of samples. So 
Let's see if it works. as this function called. Yeah. So this is basically just squaring. So this is the mean squared error. So we have 896,000. So this is the large number because our signal is in the range between minus 32,000 to plus 32,000. So the difference is actually can be thousands. And if you square a thousand, you have a million. So this is actually slightly less than a million. So basically, this just reflects how much noise we have. So now we can take the Wiener filter signal, taking also 200,000 samples, and taking this shift into account, which doesn't really matter so much, but to be precise, we should do it. So basically, it's the same equation now, taking the, white, uh, the Wiener filter version minus the original. So the Wiener filter version should have less noise. So we do the same thing, copy, paste, and we get 370,000. So this is actually pretty good, right? So it reduced the power, the noise power, by more than a factor of two. So it actually did a good job with what we told it to do to reduce the mean squared error. So it's not its fault that it doesn't sound so good, right? Because it did exactly what it's supposed to do. Yeah, so that works. So we see that the mean quadratic error is indeed less than half as much as for the noisy version y. So basically it works. So now we can take a look at the matrix A transpose A, which we used in the computation. And this is basically a 10 by 10 matrix, because we have 10 coefficients. And you can see here the entries. The first 10 coefficients, the first row, here's the second row, and so on. And you can see here, it's actually quite large numbers. And um, the next one is already lower by a factor of much to see. So we can see that it's a 10 by 10 matrix in our example for Wiener filter with 10 filter taps. And in this matrix, the next row looks almost like the previous line, but shifted by one sample to the right. So this is maybe what you can see. So here this entry 1.08 times 10 to the 12th basically appears here again, and then also here. And also with the next entry. So here you have 9.19 times 10 to the 11. It also appears here and then also here in the next row. So it's basically the next row looks like the shifted version from above. And also when you look to the left, it's basically symmetric. So again, you have this 9.19 times 10 to the 11. We also have the symmetry. Yeah. And in general, this matrix A transpose A converges to the autocorrelation matrix of the signal A. And this is because basically what that's what we did. Right? We have um, a basically a row of the noisy version and the transpose matrix is a column, group, column uh, of this noisy version and if we multiply those two we have one step of the autocorrelation and then if we take the next row we have it shifted by one sample then we have the next uh, coefficient of the autocorrelation and so on so this is what we see so this 10 by 10 matrix is basically containing the autocorrelation coefficients of our noisy signal Think about that the autocorrelation is defined like this. 
it. So this is basically what happens in this matrix multiplication A transpose A. And this type of matrix is also called triplets matrix. So if the next row is completely identical to the one above, except that it shifted, then this is called a triplets matrix. Yeah, and we can also uh, find it here in Wikipedia. Yeah, but I guess time is up. So any questions at this point? Make sense? Okay. Yeah, so thanks for your attention and have a nice rest of the day.